The answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42. Well, anyway, that's according to Douglas Adams in his trilogy in five parts that began with The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The answer to life, the universe, and everything is 42. You see, in this story, everyone knew the answer. The answer was 42. But what is more intriguing than the question that leads us to the answer of life, the universe, and everything? If the answer is 42, what's the question? What's the question? Everything uh, gives rise to that answer of 42 in the story. Now, we have the same challenge in our real world, uh, but the answer, I'm afraid to say, isn't as simple as the number 42. Oh, would that it were. That would be wonderful if it were as simple as the answer is 42. But if the answer is not that simple, that means the question has to be incredibly more complex yet. Now, in our gospel text, we kind of get John's vision of this answer. These are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. You will have life. Now, in Greek, that word that we translate life is zoe. It's actually one of several words we can use to translate as life in English. Uh, you know the words in Greek, though. I bet you don't think you do, but you do. Bios, like biology. Then we have psuche, like psychology. And we have zoe, like zoology. Zoology, not zoology. Go with me here. Um, that ology ending on all of those words, remember, is from logos. Logos, the word or study of in this case. So bios, logos, becomes biology, the study of life. Zoology is also the study of life. And psychology, or psychology as we kind of mangle the words in Greek and English, uh, ends up being the study of the psyche, the soul, the stuff of life. All three of these tie into life. So bios means animated life. That is anything that moves, anything that has that simple animation. So biology covers everything. It includes internal motion, so it includes plants as well as animals. Zoe, though, is the quality of life that is both physical and spiritual. Zoe is used to refer only to animals and only large macro animals that we can think of, both of land and of sea, that possess obvious intention, that is the spark of life fills them, that spark behind the eyes. Animals don't have quite the same level that humans do, but they've got some. And so Zoe refers to this spark of life that goes through all living things in the macro world. And when John says that his gospel is written so that you may have Zoe, so that you may have life, he's saying that you may share in God's Zoe. You may share in God's Zoe. For John wrote in chapter 1, In God was Zoe, and the Zoe was light of all people. And God was the life, and the life was the light of all people. Now, John was incredibly popular. His gospel, I should say, was incredibly popular in Scotland and Ireland. And the Celtic Christians took him seriously. In addition to the gospel and the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, which we kind of attribute to the same author, at least they're written in the same theological bent, um, there were stories, apocryphal stories, hidden stories that circulated alongside. Uh, things where John, as the beloved disciple, was the one to recline against Jesus at the Last Supper. Now, if you've seen Da Vinci's Last Supper painting, you'll see there's one of the disciples that's leaning against Jesus. That's John, the beloved disciple. This story was picked up even in Renaissance art. Um, for the Celts, the fact that John leaned against the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper meant that John heard the heartbeat of God in the universe that John heard Jesus' heartbeat, and that that let him hear the heartbeat of God through the entire universe. And he could hear it even after he was no longer listening to the chest of Jesus. Now, 
The heartbeat of the universe isn't something we hear much about in biblical text, but Paul puts it in a slightly different way in Acts chapter 17. It is in God that we live and move and have our being. It is in God that we live and move and have our being. That is, we are made of God and we live in God. In Genesis, when we read that God created the whole cosmos, and especially life on this planet, and even more especially the humans who were made in God's image, we can see God's delight in all. All is called good, and God is the source of goodness. If God is the source of goodness and all is called good, all is a part of God. We see order and chaos working together to make up the goodness of the cosmos. All is in balance and all glorifies God in our Genesis story. Great, the world is good, it is part of the goodness of God, but surely that's not the end of the story, right? I mean, at some point, we know sin enters the equation. We have some separation here. It all is not in the Garden of Eden as it once was. Surely sin breaks this balance. After all, Calvin, our good buddy Calvin, describes humanity as being in a state of total depravity. Total depravity. Now, in seminary, we would sing a song that we called Calvin's Round, and it went something like this. Turpitude, moral turpitude, depravity, depravity, inherent baseness, inherent baseness. And somehow that was supposed to get us through our theological studies. I'm not entirely sure why we loved that so, but fortunately, the truth is better than that. Uh, sin has been present in the world. There's no doubt about it. Sin smears the lens with Vaseline. We kind of see th things in a very blurry fashion. We can't see clearly because sin coats everything and it has that slick feeling and we just kind of back off and don't want to connect with each other because, ew, you're gross. It dissuades us from touching the world. From hearing the heartbeat of God, sin separates us from each other, from the world, and prevents us from hearing that heartbeat clearly. Underneath sin, though, is still the goodness of creation, the goodness of God, and just because we can't easily see it doesn't mean that it isn't still the foundation of all. Sin has clouded our vision, has separated us from God and from each other and from the earth itself. When humans read in Genesis that they have been given dominion over the earth, well, often this is read as an excuse to use the earth however they please, to use it up, to wear it out, to destroy it. But our dominance is our ability to plan ahead. We are called not to use it up as though... We're just getting to benefit from everything ourselves, but to steward the earth, to take care of it, to plan ahead, to work with the earth, to plant and to harvest in season, to shepherd and to herd cattle, to see how God is active in the world, to see how God is revealed in creation itself. God has given us gifts in the world, a bounty of gifts, including oil, natural gas, and other natural resources. But we should use these gifts wisely for the betterment of all. It is sin, after all, that calls us up to use up, to wear out, to destroy. God, the source of all being, <clears throat> the source of Zoe, calls us to use in, not use up, but use in as part of the systems of nature rather than being separate from it. We are a part of the world. We are a part of creation. God is here, and we are to use the gifts that God has given for the betterment of all. The Reformed theologian Jürgen Moltmann, try saying that five times fast, calls us to see that God made and continues to make room within God's self for life different than God. In Moltmann's writings, as described by Shirley Guthrie, the best analogy for understanding the relationship between creator and creation is not the creative power of a father who engenders and rules over life outside himself. 
but that of a mother who makes room for and nourishes new life within her own body. The life of the child she bears is at once totally dependent on her, yet has an independent life of its own. I love this vision of creation and creator, this sense of total dependence on God, being a part of and being separate from God at the same time. I think it helps us to make sense of this world that we live in, where things are. After all, we need each other. We need to find this answer to life which is that we need each other, we need God. We are siblings, God's children in the world, living with the distant cousins of the earth and cosmos. This whole universe is of God. Now, much of this sermon today is inspired by the writing of John Philip Newell, an ordained minister in the Church of Scotland. His book, The Rebirthing of God, will guide us through these following weeks of Eastertide. Now, to open this wonderfully spiritual book, he tells, well, it's kind of a base story rather than being a spiritual story. Uh, it's, I, I do need to warn you before I go into this story that it does contain scatological references. If you are not comfortable with hearing scatological references in church, um, this may be a time to walk out for a few minutes. Come back, though. Okay, thank you for all staying. <laughs> Now, Newell writes about the vision that psychologist Carl Jung had early in his life. Uh, in his early years, Jung avoided looking at a great cathedral in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, every time he looked at it, he had a vision. And that vision was there was a throne of God over this beautiful, magnificent structure of this cathedral. And coming down from the throne, descending, as it were, was, in his words, an enormous turd that smashed into the cathedral and brought down its walls. That broke the church up. Now, it may feel like we're living in the time of the smashing of the church. That's why I bring this forward. That it feels like we're in this time. Things have gone wrong. The church is dissipating. People are not responding to God's message in the pews the same way they always have in the past. Fortunately, and you're not surprised to hear me say this, there's hope, we're not done yet. Newell finishes the story with this one. A few years ago, after sharing Jung's dreamlike awareness of the enormous turd at a spirituality conference in the United States, a woman came up to me at the end of my talk. She explained that she was a midwife and that her 25 years of midwifery had led her to notice that the turd almost always comes before the birth. In other words, what is it that we need to let go of to prepare the way for new birthing, for a rebirth? What is it that we need to let go of? What is this rebirth? What does this rebirth, this new Zoe on earth look like? How will the church change? How will we rebuild? We will do so in the very being of God. We will do so in the very being of God. We don't know what it's going to look like exactly. As Jesus told the disciples in our Acts story today, only God has determined the ages and epics, that is, what happens when and how, of history. But we can rest secure in our mission to help the world listen carefully for the heartbeat of God. Newell goes on to quote Pierre Teilhard de Chardin as writing, Oneness with the Divine would be experienced not as a looking away from the earth, but as a communion with God through earth. We must let the very heart of the earth beat within us. The very heart of the earth beat within us. The very heart of God beat within us. We need to listen to that heartbeat so clearly that we resonate and beat along with God's motion in the world, that we become the body of God, taking the message of hope, of life, of Zoe, everywhere we go. And so, may you hear the heartbeat of God beating within. May the way of Jesus lead you to shepherd and steward the earth's resources. May the Holy Spirit come upon you and show you the truth of life 
that we are all part of and children of God. Amen.